Um, uh, the contributors to this study, which is focused on developing a simplified test to detect the kinds of amyloid plaques that Dr. Rabinovich just detailed, includes the National Institutes of Health and, importantly, the Alzheimer's Association through a Zenith grant, as well as additional support from foundations. Alzheimer's disease is, is uh, classified by two kinds of pathology, amyloid plaques and tau tangles in the brain. And what I'm showing in this video is the amyloid plaques growing year by year in individuals who are destined to get the disease. These amyloid plaques in the cortex and other regions of the brain continue, begin about 15 to 20 years before the first symptom onset and are fully established by the time the first memory loss is noticed by patients or families. These amyloid plaques are thought to be central to the cause of Alzheimer's disease and important for us to detect. In our current trials, where we're targeting these plaques to remove them, stop them, or slow them down. The stages of Alzheimer's disease are shown here in this rare population of people who have these mutations. And what you can see by this graph is that the second pathology of Alzheimer's disease, the tau tangles, occurs around the time of symptom onset and progresses over that time for seven to 10 years when patients notice the disease. However, the amyloid plaques, as I said, begin about 15 to 20 years before. This provides a window of opportunity in which we can detect the pathology or the changes that occur in the brain before people get sick. Ideally, what we want to do is to try to treat the brain before it gets sick, before there's extensive brain damage. And as I said, slow down, stop, or remove these plaques to try to prevent people from getting Alzheimer's disease. In order to do this, we need to be able to identify and understand how these plaques form. In 2015, we did a study to look at why the amyloid plaques are forming by measuring cerebrospinal fluid the fluid that surrounds the brain, in terms of how the amyloid beta protein that makes up these amyloid plaques is made. What you can see in the red line is that individuals who have plaques in their brain have dramatic changes in how their brains handle a specific form of amyloid beta called amyloid beta 42. These changes are characteristic and a signature of what's happening in terms of the deposition and the growth of amyloid plaques. However, our ability to use this as a widescreen test is limited because the availability of collecting cerebrospinal fluid through spinal taps is limited in many regions in the general population, and PET scans, such as the one that Dr. Rabinovich is using in the studies, are expensive and sometimes difficult to obtain in all parts of the world. And so what we really need is a, lot, a cheap, inexpensive, simple tests that we can use to find people who are at risk or have these amyloid plaques. And so the Zenith study that was funded by the Alzheimer's Association was used to determine whether we could detect this characteristic signature in the blood of people. This next slide shows that just like cerebrospinal fluid in the blood of individuals who have amyloid plaques shown in red, these individuals have changes and how the body is producing and transporting amyloid beta-42 compared to people who do not have amyloid plaques shown in the blue line. This was the first indication to us that it may be possible to look in the blood of people to find the characteristic signature of Alzheimer's disease, which are amyloid plaques. We also found interesting changes in the amounts of amyloid beta-42 in the blood. In this slide, you can see that the relative amount of amyloid beta-42 in the blood of people with plaques is lower in the blood just as it is in cerebrospinal fluid. And so the blood really mirrors what's ch changing in the cerebrospinal fluid in these patients uh, who have amyloid plaques. An important measure is for us to understand how precise or accurate this test can be in identifying people who have amyloid plaques in the brain. What this chart shows is that with a cutoff of around 0.124, that we can largely ex tell who has amyloid plaques. And in the group that doesn't have amyloid plaques, we can exclude the majority of people who do not have amyloid plaques. But it's not a perfect test 
when currently compared to the PET scans or cerebrospinal fluid. And so for this reason, this test is most likely to be useful currently as a screening test to identify tens of thousands or even millions of people who may be at risk for Alzheimer's disease. This shows the relationship between the cerebrospinal fluid on the X or bottom axis and the blood ratios on the Y axis. And you can see that there is a correlation, a relationship between what we find in cerebrospinal fluid and what we find in blood of these individuals. Furthermore, on the right panel, the amyloid plaque scans, as measured by a PIB PET scan, indicate that our ability to detect those individuals who are amyloid positive is quite good, and we can again identify the individuals who are not likely to have amyloid plaques in the blue dots. So the conclusions of this study are that in a pre-specified validated study where we indicated what the goals were up front, registered the study on clinicaltrials.gov, and then set out to test the hypothesis, we were able to demonstrate that the blood, in fact, has the same characteristic signatures that are present in the cerebrospinal fluid that surrounds the brain. Furthermore, what we consider the gold standard detectors for amyloid plaques in the brain, which are the amyloid PET scans and the cerebrospinal fluid, are related and correlated with a blood test. This blood beta amyloid test can be used to detect the amyloid plaques of Alzheimer's disease in the brains of participants and patients, and that we now think this kind of test can be used to screen many thousands of patients to identify those who are at high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and to quickly and efficiently enroll those participants into interventional trials to try to prevent or stop the disease. This is critical. The time it takes us to enroll people in a trial is directly proportional to the overall cost and the time it takes to get an answer about a specific drug or therapy. In some studies, prevention studies for example, it can take us three to four years or longer to finish enrolling in a trial. That's three to four years longer that the, we have to wait as a group of researchers and as a society to determine what drugs are effective. What can be even more impactful, that dramatically increases the cost of these kinds of trials, limiting the number of drugs and therapies that we can test. A simplified test that's easy to administer and relatively inexpensive and allows us to screen large numbers of people promises to greatly accelerate our ability to find better drugs and treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Finally, when effective treatments are found, a screening test like this could be used as part of a standard of care. When people go to the doctor's office for their regular checkup in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, one could use a test like this to identify those who are at risk of getting Alzheimer's disease and treat them. I'd like to thank the uh, Alzheimer's Association, the patients and families that contributed to the study, and to my lab that helped lead a lot of this research. Thank you.